Despite his formidable contributions to the shaping of the American Republic and his prescient vision of the United States as a global world power, Alexander Hamilton never captured the hearts of Americans in the way that Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln were able to do so. Yet Hamilton was a founding father, soldier, economist, political philosopher, one of America's first constitutional lawyers, and the first United States Secretary of the Treasury. And as Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton was the primary author of the economic policies of the George Washington administration, the funding of state debts by the federal government, the establishment of a national bank, a system of tariffs, friendly trade relations with Great Britain. John Horrigan is an accomplished stage actor, historical lecturer, professional sports announcer, and the host of a cable television program, The Folklorist. In addition, he is a member of the Lincoln Minutemen and belongs to a group of historical reenactors known as Solo Together. This is John's debut portrayal of an historical character. Join us as he attempts to bring Alexander Hamilton to life on the eve of his death. It is July the 4th, 1804. I am reflecting back upon my life. Tomorrow, at dawn, is a very important occasion for me. But more on that in a moment. When they tell you that I was born in the year 1755, on the island of Nevis in the West Indies, let them know that I am two years younger in the heart. My father James was the son of a Scottish lord, and he abandoned my mother Rachel, my brother James and I, after my mother's first husband, a spiteful man named Johann Levine, filed for divorce under such lecherous circumstances as bigamy, abandonment, in adultery. My mother had to work very hard selling her wares in a store in Christensted. In February of 1768, she died of the fever and a broken heart, leaving my brother James and I orphaned. Mr. Levine came and seized my mother's assets. He took everything, her silver, even my, my prized library of 34 books, including Roman and Greek classics, had not a friend intervened and purchased the books back for me. I love those books. I love to read. The art of reading is to skip judiciously. Well, I had a good command of the French language. My mother taught me that. And on the island of St. Croix, that put me in good stead. And at the age of 11, orphaned, we were adopted by a cousin named Peter Lighton. He later took his own life. My brother James became apprenticed to a local carpenter. I, I was adopted by a Nevis merchant by the name of Thomas Stevens, a good man. In fact, I got on very well with his son Edward. We were so alike in many, many ways. I apprenticed at an import-export counting house known as Beekman and Kruger, and there, I got on nicely as a clerk in the day-to-day -day business operations. In fact, Mr. Kruger left the business in 1771 for five months and left me at the age of 13 in charge. I learned a great deal. I loved reading, but I developed a fondness for writing. In fact, I recorded a sermon by the Reverend Hugh Knox, a fiery sermon verbatim and it was published in the Royal Danish American Gazette. In fact, on August 30th of 1772, a wicked hurricane lashed the island of St. Croix. And I recorded such a great account that those who read the Royal American Danish Gazette decided that I had some talents in my writing. And in fact, friends and some of the important people of the island collected a fund and they sent me to the North American colonies. In 1772, I arrived in Boston, and I headed south, where I attended Elizabethtown Academy. And I tutored under Mr. William Livingston, a brilliant man, a revolutionary. 
He taught me so much. After a year, I decided to apply for college. I applied to the College of New Jersey, now some people refer to it as Princeton, and asked for an accelerated curriculum. They declined. It was then that I applied to King's College and asked for the same prerequisite, and they obliged. It took me only one year before I obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree, but I learned a great deal when I, while I attended King's College. I learned how to write. A reverend, a clergyman, a loyalist by the name of Seabury, a farmer, published these letters denouncing the First Congress and denouncing the revolutionary cause. And I came back with a full vindication of Congress and another article that I called The Farmer Refuted. I also attacked the Quebec Act, and I had 14 anonymous installments under the moniker, The Monitor, that I submitted to Holt's New York Journal. I support the revolutionary cause, but I do not support mob rep reprisals against loyalists. In fact, the president of King's College, a loyalist, was surrounded by a mob who wished to tar and feather him. I intervened and I kept them amused with my eloquence and at bay while he found an escape. Now during my time at King's College, I joined a volunteer artillery militia and we practiced our maneuvers every single day before classes and I studied up on the tactics of artillery. And in fact, when it came around to August of 1775, we seized cannon, British cannon at the battery we were being fired upon by the HMS Asia, and we held our own. In March 14th of 1776, I was commissioned as captain of our artillery company. I participated in the Battle of Long Island in August of 1776, the Battle of White Plains that October. In fact, I protected the withdrawal of Smallwood's militia. And then some say, Perhaps my finest hour, January 1777, at Trenton. I protected General Washington and the Continental Army's hasty but organized withdrawal. I manned the crossroads and put down a hellacious fire of artillery down on the Hessians. We thrashed them, but good. My actions came to the attention of General Nathaniel Green and General Henry Knox, and they both offered me the position of aide-de-camp. I declined. I wanted to obtain more glory in the battlefield. It was at this time, though, that General Nathaniel Green introduced me to General Washington, His Excellency. And General offered me the position, and I accepted, after he promoted me to Lieutenant Colonel, of aide-de-camp, chief of his affairs, and a confidant. He left me in charge of his intelligence, his diplomacy, and his correspondence with his field officers, the senior commanders of the Army. I learned a great deal under General Washington. I have tremendous respect for him. We weren't that close personally, but he respected me and I respected him. Yes, we would clash, but my time under the General was fulfilling. In fact, during that time, I, I met the Marquis de Lafayette, and the Marquis was a good man. And I also met my lifelong friend, John Lawrence. Well, I told the general that I no longer wanted to be aide de camp. I had to get back on the battlefield and get back to campaigning. And he recommissioned me and put me in charge of three battalions at Yorktown. And it was there, we had a bayonet rush on redoubt number nine and redoubt number 10 with the assistance of the French that we took Yorktown and we saw the capitulation of Cornwallis. Well, after the war, I was elected to Congress, the Congress of Confederation, and we had a fledgling federal government that was broke. We had so much debt. The Congress was relying on subsidies from the King of France, on, on, on payments that the states promised and never paid, and also European loans. We needed to finance a strong central federal government, and the only, thing that we, only way we could do this was to impose tariffs an impost, a 5% duty on imports. That's not asking much to retire the debt. 
The states, moreover, could not pay their own debt that they owed to the revolutionary cause. We needed a central government for the states to roll up to. It was there that I saw that the Articles of Confederation were lacking. And early in 1783, soldiers from Newburgh rioted. They hadn't been paid. They were paying for their own supplies. And again, in June of 1783, soldiers from Pennsylvania marched on Philadelphia, forcing Congress to evacuate to Princeton. We needed a strong central government. I decided to leave in 1784. And at that point, I went into law practice. I studied law on my own, took the New York bar, I went on to found the, Nash, the first Bank of New York. I decided to return to politics in 1786 when I attended the Annapolis Convention, when I saw that the Articles of Confederation were lacking, and I called for a constitution. And in 1787, I was the first delegate to the United States Constitution. And there we set the framework of a stable, centralized, powerful federal government. And we broke it into the executive, judicial, and legislative branches. And it was about that time, my wife Eliza, who I had eight children with, I got into a dalliance with a Mariah Reynolds and Mr. James Madison. And Mr. James Monroe and Aaron Burr found out about it and held that out as blackmail over my head. I was forced to resign my position as the United States Secretary of Treasury. And in the election of 1796, I decided to support Thomas Pinckney of South Carolina, not John Adams. I figured John Adams, who was a vice president under George Washington, would serve as another vice president. So at that point, I decided to support Pinckney. Unfortunately, my plan backfired. Adams got elected president, and the vice president was one Thomas Jefferson. I served under Adams. He made me major general of the army. By the election of 1800, I decided that I wanted Thomas Pinckney's older brother, Charles as president. Well, the electors did not rally behind me, and somehow a deadlock between Thomas Jefferson and a one Aaron Burr. And I decided to side with Jefferson because out of the two, he's the honest one. And in 1804, I made sure that Mr. Burr was not elected governor of New York. I made sure that he was not going to be elected the president of the United States. And here I am today, July 10th, 1804, tomorrow morning, Tomorrow morning, I get in a boat and cross the Hudson to the West Bank of New Jersey to Weehawken, where my son Philip was killed in a duel three years earlier, and I will face Mr. Aaron Burr. I am the honorable one. I shall throw away my first shot. That is the honorable thing to do. And I will not stand for someone to slander me and libel me as Mr. Burr has. And tomorrow then, tomorrow, the course of the United States will be changed when I decide to get rid of Mr. Aaron Burr. God bless the United States. This is my third duel. I've gotten out of two duels and I will get out of this one. But if it weren't for my actions, we would not have a strong centralized United States government. And now my friends, and now my dear Eliza, I tell you that I love you, and I will see you in the afternoon. Thank you.